Okay, so this is our uh, process talk. Um, it's the first series of events where uh, writers will talk about uh, their literary process while screening images uh, that depict visual reality. Um, we are going to do another such event with Victoria Chang and Andrew Lamb later this year. Um, but uh, today, we're lucky to have uh, four great writers coming from out of town um, who are here, thanks to the largesse of Kundimon, um, <laughs> whose conference we are mooching off of. Um, Kundimon is a fantastic organization. Uh, if you are an Asian American poet or fiction writer, I recommend you look them up and get other writers to come to New York so we can also mooch off that travel <laughs> funding. Just kidding. Apply to their fellowship. Okay, first... Um, we have Jeswinder Bolina, who is uh, on the faculty of the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Miami and the author of Phantom Camera and Carrier Wave. The first was the winner of the 2012 Green Rose Prize uh, from New Shoes Press. The second, the winner of the 2006 Colorado Prize. His work has been published in Best American Poetry, the Poetry Foundation, The State, and Himmel, South Asia. Let's give him a hand. Ken, um, thank you to all of you for being here. I can't really see any of you, which is good or bad. We're an invisible minority. Uh, <laughs> maybe you are. Um, I'm up with the lights. No. Um, so um, uh, I, I wasn't quite sure what to do with um, the craft talk uh, because, as I was saying to David Tomas Martinez, who I've been hanging out with for the last couple of days. Um, a lot of you might not know who the hell I am, and you're like, why do we want to hear how he writes his poetry? And then I was also thinking, like, why would I tell you my secrets? Um, so I'm actually going to read a few um, poems, and I guess just kind of talk about how they, I guess, reflect or relate to um, my, my kind of thoughts about writing um, and, and how, like, the poem maybe comes together a little bit loosely. Um, there may eventually be an image up here. Um, you know, it's, it, this isn't going to seem weird to any of you, um, I think. I write a lot in notebooks. Um, I, I, I have a bad habit of buying too many notebooks and never using them. Um, so I have like seven notebooks that have the first like 20 pages are all scrawled in and the rest is pristine. Then I have to put them all back together. But most of my writing takes place there and then the composition takes place on the computer. So you're welcome, Apple computer. Or <laughs> being one more person who was advertising for you. Um, but in general, I, I think um, that what I'm going to try to read are a po about four poems that um, come from different uh, generative methods for me. Sometimes they come from just like I write down a line or like a phrase and um, the whole thing grows out of that. Sometimes I have like a, a really deliberate thing that I'm trying to do. Um, and sometimes I'm just really sick of myself and I try to write something that doesn't sound like me, which never works. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with um, a poem I, I, w I wrote a little while ago. It, it's called New Adventures in Sci-Fi, um, which for those of you who are old enough and, uh, you know, suburban enough, you'll remember the album New Adventures in Hi-Fi by R.E.M., um, which, I don't know, that was in my head for some reason. So I changed to sci-fi. It was mostly that I wanted to talk about a different um, version of science fiction where nobody had any superpowers or anything. And like it was just a different version of the world. We have all this sci-fi where all this weird, random shit happens. But we know it'll never happen in real life. Thor is not going to fall out of the sky. I'm sorry if, if that disappointed you. Um, so I thought, what would it look like, and what would my version of that be? Um, and mostly I wanted to include a line that talked about Republicans actually listening to us, I guess. If there are Republicans in the room, I... Sorry. Um, so, but that was it. That was the line. I was trying to figure out, how do I get to that claim? New adventures in sci-fi. <laughs> Multimedia. We inhabit a bland planet. Prattle and shop in precincts, no photons torpedo. Nobody wormholes. Nobody telekinetic. Not one of us can fly. But we sweat no interest accruing in our MasterCards either. No caps on our data plans. 
no gaps in our Medicaid through the fevers of spring, through our 17 months of summer, our seven throngs of fall, when the leaves change several times an hour until it snows those days we need it to snow. So the sun can come thaw the barrio dry, lay itself easy as a leg draped across your legs on a porch swing. Everybody has a porch swing. The beat cops wave to when they pass. They don't protect us bloody or hunt us as if they are monsters afraid of the dark. They don't police the teeth out of our heads. We are not fearful of any invaders emigrating into our work cloud. No jingo caucus gums up our galactic congress. No bigot polemic commandeers our election cycle. Our super PACs protect us. Our lobbyists defend us. Even our Republicans consider our expertise. Not one is an American. There's no such thing as Americans. There are only bisexuals. <laughs> All 46 of our black presidents, all 37 of them women, all us bisexuals infatuated with each other. <laughs> and all our caliphs desire is a key party. All our Zions require mutual consent. There is no God, and there is no God. So we get on with our farming and barbecue. So when the aliens come, they come for our cuisine. They stay for our bar scene tip us heavy and split their spliffs with us at sunup on the beach before breakfast, before taking us for a matinee where they marvel at our CGI, our real 3D, the real 3D of our angst that depicts them wicked as we are, hungry grunts always fixing for a fight. Um, yeah, so I guess that's one of the, like, a, it's a poem that was a concept, and then the, the thing for me ends up always being... Um, as Laura, who was at Kundi Man, will uh, acknowledge, um, it's always to disrupt the, the pattern. So if you're going to talk about sci-fi, um, you know, there should be Republicans in it. There should be, <laughs> there should be a spliff in it. I've never watched a sci-fi movie where anybody mentioned a spliff, but meanwhile, in the real world, everyone's like rolling joints, right? I mean... <laughs> And so I'm always trying to get all that in, um, and I'm trying to get the thing in that doesn't seem to belong there. Um, so I think that drives um, a lot of my work. Um, on, a, on a related note, especially in this manuscript, um, which is new and it's still in progress, um, part of getting different language in is to get literally different languages in. And so for the first time, I'm kind of embracing the fact that I grew up speaking Punjabi and I'm like some of those words are dropping in and, and um, you know I live in Miami and there's Spanish everywhere and I, I don't always pronounce it right but you know it's there and I know it and I hear it um, and and just in general when we hear um, on the news the weird thing is the news is full of foreign language although it's always treated very oddly and, and Anglicanized and, and weird things happen so this is a poem um, that I think will speak a little bit to that, I mean, there, I'm trying to put in some language here that I don't usually put in to, or I haven't in the past put in. Things like Dabba and Lassi and all these things I grew up hearing. Um, and it's also, a, it's, a, it's kind of a love poem to a drone pilot. Um, I, I read an article, uh, and that's what, part of the thing that isn't up here is I, I read a ton of source material, uh, whether it's, you know, magazines, uh, uh, you know, like the National Review, even if it's uh, conservative or scientific American or whatever it is, I'm trying to pull all that in. And so that sits back there, and I, I, I've started to write, I think, in a way that's pretty topical. Um, but I don't know everything about these subjects, so I have to simulate these subject positions um, and hope that I earn the right to talk about them. So <laughs> this is... Um, it's called, a, it's called Letter to a Drone Pilot, and it's sort of like a love letter written from the perspective of somebody being targeted by drones. Yeah. All right, I'll read it. In my dream of you, perched in a turret in your white gamise with the blue star print, my oxen move through your spyglass trained on me in a far-off valley where my caravan trundles into my dream of you 
on an overpass, in your helmet and overalls, lobbing fruit at my pickup truck, while I drive on into the dunes of my dream of you in a flight suit at your high station, noting every <coughs> blink of my turn signal, every dabba I stop in for tea in my dream of you, as a thin motor whine pervading the airspace between the fellaheen markets of my dream of you who follows me down every arcade and into every courtyard, who listens to my soft swallows on the phone, rifles through my every communique, and watches me undress from a skylight in the thatched roof of the plaster house of my dream of you, where you sit with a panther at the foot of your rocking chair, a hatchet on one knee, and I enter through a beaded curtain from the kitchen with a bowl of dal and a jug of lussie for you in your dress blues and your headset, its microphone grazing your lower lip in the monitor glow of my dream of you. You slip your tongue into my ear, your hand in the damp between my legs. I'm naked as the rain, and you are a bunion tree with your tangle of prop roots fingering my entire earth in your dream of me. I tumble and flail with a nine-pound awl and a rope saw in your dream of me as a bull you hack your saber through in my dream of you as an office tower, then me as the zealot boy bringing you down, darling, I do mean you harm, and you do mean me harm. So why do you feign restraint as if it's a kind of habit? Dress yourself in cloud cover and raise your hand like a nun nearly unwilling, as if there isn't any lust in your malice, no feeling like a good fuck when you land your hellfire home. That's the first time I ever used the word fuck in a poem. <laughs> so I thought I'd share. Um, so I, I do some of that stuff, and then I get, um, I have like these narrative poems that are in like voices, and, um, and then I get really sick of them, and I, I, I don't know, I try other things that are more musically driven, um, and... I have another one that, like, it, it's it, it's so far out of my comfort comfort zone that I don't feel comfortable reading it out loud yet. Like, it's in the manuscript, but that's actually it used to freak me out. Like, maybe it's not a good poem, and I should throw it away. But now I'm starting to think that I'm not reading it because I'm 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 scared that like I haven't quite got it right. Um, this one, though, I'm going to read. And apologies to the Kundiman folks because they heard it the other night. Um, but this was, uh, you know, took a, a while, and, and, and it sounds different, and I don't, as I said the other night, I don't quite know that I'm reading it right yet. Um, but I'm still scared, like, to read it out loud, you know, and, that, and that's a weird thing when you get up in front of an audience and you start to give banter and you start to explain things. It's born out of this fear that the, that the person sitting there is going to think, man, that sucked. But it's okay if it sucks, I think. Um, I mean, it's not okay for, for my, my career and shit, but it's okay for you if it sucks. You'll be out of here soon. Um, but yeah, so that fear is maybe a good thing, you know, and, and that's it. Like, even I, 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 I sweat really easily, and I know that, like, a reading's going okay if I break a sweat. Because if I don't, it means I'm not really freaked out by what I'm saying. Um, I'm comfortable. And if I'm comfortable, it's possible that the poem is too comfortable. Um, so, you know, I don't get nervous in front of people. I just get worried that the work is no good. Um, but I'm going to read this poem <clears throat> that I read the other night. It, it's called Country Western. I'm reading it again because it, it, I wrote it really thinking of my immigrant parents. And um, as I said the other night, and once again tonight, um, it is rare to be in a room full of folks who are so close to that experience whether any of you are immigrants, a lot of us in this room are probably children uh, of immigrants. We're not so far removed. Um, and I, was, I wrote this one kind of thinking of, thinking of them and, um, and try to take up that perspective. It's called um, Country Western, but there's a comma. It's Country Comma Western. <laughs> Clever. My wife, my wife, whenever she says something smart, she does this and goes, kidneys. <laughs> Country Western. Via carriage and steamer and saddle and rail. Via twin prop and airship and ship of the desert. Via savanna, via step, via zip line and glider. Under moat and under rampart. Over barb and under wire. 
under three green seas, via burrow, via grapple, via ballistic trajectory, like broke satellites cratered in alien dirt, like banged knuckles on the door of an uneasy speakeasy, we were the party after the party nobody wanted. Sober and famished, we were the parched fronds, beggared and supplicant to the clouds, the clouds distant and cool as a bourgeoisie, and we without our sleep coats, and we without our hail hats, with less than a shekel, less than a rupee, less than a kroner or any glinting Kennedy, three pence short of a peso. We arrived over guard and under sentry, via catapult, via coyote, via many genies blinking, we arrived bats in a manse no bat should inhabit. So we grew fin and we grew talon. We scrambled arachnid and jaguar in the canopy, dissembled, reassembled. And it's true we piss now in marbled closets and shower indoors as if we are clergy. It's true no junta defiles us, no furious bomber or hegemon's boot, but the faces on the currency all watch me. The paintings in the museum all say, this is life on earth, this is life on earth. So I'm jealous of their candor, but that isn't my pasty duchess. That isn't my butchered messiah. That isn't my bounty of meat beside the gilded chalice. I'm no Medici, and that isn't my life on earth. I arrived in via wormhole, via subspace, via mothership descending in a snap button sarong in a denim sari, in my 10-gallon turban. I look so authentic, you'd almost believe it's the 44th of July. I'm the sheriff of this here cow town. I'm one jack better than a straight flush. Buzzards above the valley, I can see the whites of your eyes. My name is Consuela. You can call me Mr. President. You can reach for the sky. That's actually, that's a, a, I noticed now reading that there's, there, aside from that ling linguistic uh, disruption, Laura, that I, that I was talking about in those workshops, there's also a thing that's, I think, happening that I'm <clears throat> trying to do, which is um, let the language drive disruptions of, like, uh, place, of geography, ethnicity, uh, currency, and that, um, and gender, even. Where I was trying to figure out, like, you know, my name is blank, and I thought, well, what's the best sounding name? And the one that popped in my head was Consuela. And I thought, yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, it's the language. It doesn't matter that it's me or not me. Um, so finally, I'm going to read um, <clears throat> one last poem. And this is maybe at the heart of um, those first two books and, and probably this one. And is really a part of my process, uh, very directly a part of my process, which is the attempt. And I, and I wish... I do this because I wish, I, I, I get so excited when I see it, and I wish I would see more of it, which is the, the kind of melding of the personal and the political. For years, especially uh, when I was doing, like when I was first being introduced to poetry in college and after, there was this sort of idea that um, there was poetry, right? Which meant like lyric poetry about birds and stuff. Um, and then there was experimental poetry, which didn't make any sense. And then there was political poetry, and I don't, I don't believe in any of those. I don't know why, and we all know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm probably speaking to everyone who agrees that there's not a distinction between that. And yet, for years, people protected those distinctions, um, and I think it was protect to, in order to protect like jobs and and getting stuff published, and um, and they would freak out if you were like a lyric poet, and then. You mentioned like race in your poem. They'd be like, "What the fuck? No, that's that's for the slam people over there, you know." And, and the slam people weren't taken seriously because they were being political. And but it's all political. Um, and so what I try to do often is is just shove that together, and it's mostly by language. If um, if I'm going to have a, bo a poem about this, I better use some language from a poem that does that that doesn't. You know, or language that doesn't belong in a poem about this. So this is a poem that I wrote um, <clears throat> about my cousin, who is, is very much. A, we don't have the word cousin in Punjabi. Everyone's your sister, um, and your second cousins are your nieces and nephews, right? And it just so I just know her as my sister, and she's very much like my sister. Um, and I lived with her for um, 
I was doing a visiting thing in Chicago at Columbia, Chicago, and I lived with her for that um, year. She was really kind and, and said, I have a spare room. Don't get an apartment. Just crash here. And then she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and so I, I, you know, fortunately, I hope for her and, and certainly for me, I got to be there and help her, you know, through that day to day. Um, I hope it helped. Um, but so this is a poem that I wrote as a response to that. Um, I realize this can get a little bit confusing in New York because if you're from Chicago, the tallest building in America is the Sears Tower, which is now called the Willis Tower. Um, but in New York, the, the new trade center is claimed to be taller, but it's not actually taller. They count the thing. Anyway, um, it gets confusing. But So it's called the tallest building in America. And if anybody from New York is like, but why is everything in Chicago the tallest? You know, anyway, that's why. <laughs> The tallest building in America. In the season of her first cancer, my sister looms over lampposts, over broadcast antennas, over cicadas in flight. News helicopters chuckle below her, but I can see her from every corner druggist. I can see her from the pier at Pratt Street Beach, from the Botanic Gardens in Glencoe, from every expressway and ring road. I can see her from, her, from Ohio, or maybe it's her tumor. Yeah, her tumor is the tallest building in America, rising into her chest like a spire shoved into the troposphere. I call it her first cancer because any cancer that isn't the last cancer is an only fleetingly crowned behemoth crowding her skyline. Any new cancer will be much, much taller. So the next cancer becomes the tallest building in America. Every road goes there. When I think this way of the epic encroaching future, I become the tallest building in America, able to see over quivering horizons. The president must feel this too when our civic maladies metastasize into national disasters, and when he does, he's the tallest building in America. Until his agenda is thwarted by the majority whip, so the speaker of the house is certain he's the tallest building in America, but the Fox newsroom overlooking the avenue of the Americas is taller. For years, the kitschy white folks who yammer there tell me Osama bin Laden is the tallest building in America, and it's better to throw boots through his windows until the weather gets in, until his rebar corrodes, until he teeters into the sea. When this happens, the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency in Langley, Virginia becomes the tallest building in America, though the Chamber of Commerce is much, much taller. It worries China's rising monstrous and tall, but I remember when stern Russia lumbered larger, and I'm nostalgic then for our antique enemies. Nostalgia always has been the tallest building in America. But later, I'm walking through the elastic shadows of Fullerton Avenue to the Lincoln Park Zoo to wonder at the hopeless daffy giraffes, or I'm in the signature room of the Hancock Building for a bourbon alone, and I think, no, above all these, my sister is the tallest building in America but all her joists are showing. Scaffoldings hem her. Work lights scream from floor to ceiling gaps in her where windows should go, but there aren't any windows. So the monsoons of autumn royal clear through, and from this height, the other buildings are small, the people beneath them smaller, their other concerns minute, their other catastrophes smaller, those other folks, remote little lymph nodes about their diligent business, their other lives enduring in a sanguine nation, in a small and temporary country. Thank you. Thank you, Jaswinder. Next, we have Ching and Chen. Do you want to frame your stuff? Or? Okay. Uh, a genderqueer, multi genre writer, Ching and Chen is the author of The Heart's Traffic. Uh, she, they are a Kundiman, Lambda, and Kalalu fellow, as well as a community organizer who has worked in Asian American communities in San Francisco, Oakland, Riverside, and Boston. Um, they are the editor of The Revolution Starts at Home, Confronting Intimate Violence Within Activist Communities, and Here is a Pen, an anthology of West Coast Kundiman poets. And if you look on the margins, um, there's a piece by Hannah Mariyama that's kind of writing about Sam Chingan's work. Let's give her a hand. They, they may. Everyone. Thank you, Ken and Asian American Writers Workshop, to my fellow readers. Um, and 
What you're about to see is a projection, and I just want to tell you a little bit about the, the inputs or what I was thinking. Um, and I'll be happy to talk more in Q&A or you know, one-on-one if you have more questions about the process. So um, this piece um, is actually uh, two pieces sandwiched within another, but they all um, are coming from similar strands of inquiry. Um, I have been thinking a long time about multi-directional uh, writing and how can I um, think about different things happening at the same time and returning to those things because I think I, I'm very obsessed with memory and ghosts. Um, and so um, I had um, some version of, of these writings um, and I was at a writing residency in Spain and the the writing coordinator um, asked us to do a showcase and said something along the lines of, we've had writers come here before and a lot of the people that are here understand English, but it's not their first language. And don't be bored. <laughs> so um, I was thinking about um, how can I present this work, which, um, so the, the three inputs that I'm gonna think about are from my family. My father is um, a big bullshitter. He'll tell stories. I guess he's kind of a mansplainer as well, but he will like t start telling stories, and if he doesn't know, he doesn't tell you. He'll just be like, he'll just make something up, but he sounds very <laughs> sure. So you, if you don't know him, you might not know that he's just kind of, you know, telling you a story. Um, and my mother is the opposite. She's um, someone who keeps information, and it's um, valuable. So you have to know how to trick her to get information that's very valuable. So they're on both ends of the spectrum. And I grew up um, also in a similar vein um, as a child of immigrant, and oftentimes um, writing for my parents or correcting their language and their syntax. And so I think a lot of my poetry thinks about language in this way, in this um, weird syntax, um, you know, and so, one of the things I was worried about is, okay, I'm going to display my poetry and it's gonna be in really strange, weird syn syntax. And what can I do? So this is, um, this is what came out of that process. And the images I put as part of it is just another layer of feeling that I wanna vote. And I credited all the artists. Thank you.
Thank you. That was really great. Next, we have uh, Beth Min Nguyen, uh, the author of Short Girls, a novel which won the American Book Award in Fiction and the Library Journal Best Book of the Year. Stealing Buddha's Dinner, a memoir which received the Penn Gerard Award, uh, as well as Chicago Tribune Best Book of the Year Award, as well as being a finalist for our own Asian American Literary Award. Um, her newest novel is Pioneer Girl, a literary mystery about second generation, uh, a second generation Vietnamese family and their ties to the little house on the prairie. Let's give her a hand. I should have gone last because I'm the shortest. That's how they should always do these readings. <laughs> by height. Shortest, yeah, by height. I always go last. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, Asian American Writers Workshop. Thank you all for being here, and my fellow writers and readers. It's um, it's this really cool idea to talk about process. So this book, Pioneer Girl. I object to the title because it's not mine. And to this day, I kind of bristle at it. My title was Little Gray House in the West, because it's sort of about Little House on the Prairie, and I wanted to echo it. But my editor, and it kind of went up the chain, they were just like, that's not a good that title. is just too quiet, and I lost the battle. And so now I have the title that I'm kind of annoyed at. And the worst thing is that after my editor like really fought for this title, I knew a girl, about a month later, she left. And I was like, really? <laughs> you, just, you could have just let me have that. Uh, it's this book started because, it started in childhood, really, because I was obsessed with Little House on the Prairie, the books. And I read them over and over. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized that I was probably interested in Little House on the Prairie because it's about a pioneering family moving a lot, moving westward. Probably a lot of you have read these, right? Uh, moving westward, starting over, and my family had kind of done the same, moved, moved westward to the United States in 1975 as refugees from Vietnam. And so something about that parallel between immigration and migration, I think must have resonated with me when I was a child, though I didn't know it at the time. So I was, you know, always interested in these books, and th this is, I think, supposed to be like this Asian girl on the prairie, and uh, I was always interested, but... <laughs> I was also really aware that these books are tremendously white. And I, when I had this sort of idea about, like, what am I going to write my next novel about, I had this in my mind. And I wasn't sure why. And it's, it's a strange thing to write a novel because of all the things in the world you could write about. How do you decide on this one thing, this set of characters, this particular place, this the setting? How do you figure that out, given all the possible subjects? And I think a, a very typical path is to follow your obsessions or let your obsessions drive you somewhere. And this was so much in my mind. And um, so was this idea of immigration and uh, being the children of immigrants and the clash between first and second generation. That I felt that there had to be something there. I just didn't know what it was. And every time, not every time, but a lot of times when I would talk to white people about Little House on the Prairie, they would sort of express interest or sort of fascination um, about why an Asian person was so into it. You know, like, you know, <laughs> it makes sense why white people would love a little house on the prairie, because it's about them. But it's like, really? Like, Asian people? There are no Asians anywhere here. None. Um, they, don't even, they don't even acknowledge that Asian Americans built the railroad. So um, it was a question in my mind. And then, I was doing all this research on Little House on the Prairie, and I learned about how Laura Ingalls Wilder's daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, co-wrote those books. She's not credited because she didn't she didn't want the credit. She thought they were she thought it was juvenile literature, and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. But she was a, a writer and a journalist and a storyteller, and she was really the one who crafted the, these books into into what they are. And I was really interested in that, and I started researching Rose Wilder Lane. And then I discovered that Rose Wilder Lane had been to Vietnam in 1965 as a reporter. So, so I thought, this is really strange, and I need to find out more. And I, and I said, i got to go do this research. And it turns out that Rose Wilder Lane's archives, her, all of her papers, are in Iowa at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, which is random, but I guess they were friends. And that's where all her papers are. <laughs> so you have to go to West Branch, Iowa, which is not far from Iowa City. 
if you want to read her papers. And uh, so I went there and I started doing all this research. And in the first image, we'll show you some of the things that I found regarding Rose Wilder's trip to Vietnam. So she went uh, at the behest of Woman's Day magazine. Woman's Day wanted Rose, who was a very well-known journalist, to write about the war in Vietnam from a woman's perspective. You know, from a white woman's perspective. What is, what is Vietnam like? What are the people like? <coughs> And they were, her papers were really not very well organized, and they just had all these little souvenirs and documents, like her boarding pass and postcards from the hotels where she stayed. And, you know, this is some of her, um, her, her documentation, and just to show that she had been there. And she, a lot of her journals were talking about it. And I was looking through all this stuff, and I thought, well, this, you know, she was really there, Mrs. R. Lane, and she was there for a while visiting and, you know, as a tourist, trying to figure out, and the piece that she ended up writing was, was really touristy. She talks about the women of Vietnam being, you know, golden, literally golden, their skin like gold. And, like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then and the next image shows uh, what's really interesting, because it shows, it, you see in the return address, Han Tin uh, of, of Hue in Vietnam. And I found all these letters, this correspondence, these correspondence pieces from this person named Kam Tin. And he was a friend that she had met in Vietnam. And they exchanged letters for years. And there were a couple of pictures, which I, I don't have anymore, but I kept a lot of this, these pictures of, of their correspondence. And I thought, That's, this is so strange, so interesting that she befriended people there. And so much of it became pen pals for years. And I wonder, what happened to them? What happened to uh, Khan Tin and his family? What kind of relationship did they have? And you know, what, is this, what does this mean on a larger scale? And then the last image is one of the postcards that he sent. Dear Mrs. Lane, I hope you are as healthy and happy as always. Um, wishing you a very nice Thanksgiving day. Respectfully, Tin. And she lived in Texas at the time. And most of our correspondence was like this. He was just really polite and just sort of talking about reading and improving his English. And uh, it started my imagination going about what it would be like if there, was, if there had been a bigger story than a polite friendship. And I thought, well, what if it had been you know, my family, my, my character's family, who had had a real, some relationship with Rose Wilder Lane that was more interesting than this? And that, in fact, there was a, a deeper literary connection, a deeper literary mystery um, that came of this trip of hers to Vietnam and that came of her meeting people in Vietnam. After that, after I was thinking about that, I, I visited the various Little House on the Prairie museums and sites. And if you have read those books, you know that a lot of those, those the artifacts in the book, like the violin and the piano, a lot of that stuff still exists. Uh, and you can still see it on display. Some of it is gone. And one of the important things of the books is gone, which is a, a gold pin that Rose's husband, uh, who wasn't her husband then, but he gave her this golden pin. And um, it's, it figures very importantly in one of the books. And that sort of stayed in my mind because that piece of jewelry has been lost. So I was like, OK, I have characters. I have a connection. I have a place. I have this sort of vague idea of some thematic idea I want to perhaps make between immigration and migration. You know what? That's enough for a novel. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough to begin a really uh, shaky draft of a novel. And then many, many, many revisions and drafts later, I came up with this. I'm just going to read you part of the very beginning. In August 1965, a woman named Rose walked into my grandfather's cafe in Saigon. That much is known. My grandfather would say, that's the beginning of this story. My mother would say, I should have left it at that. Back then, my mother and grandfather lived in the rooms above the cafe. She was 12, an only child whose own mother had died the year before. In the evenings, my grandfather taught her English from a friend's borrowed textbook. He had a feeling, he used to say, that it was the language of their future. On that day, when an American woman sat down at one of his teak tables, looked around at the blue trimmed doorways and the ceiling fans that had paddles shaped like ginkgo leaves, he took it as a sign. 
She asked for coffee or tea, whichever was freshest, and he brought her a cup of French roast with condensed milk and half a baguette, using his most careful pronunciation to ask if she needed some kind of help. It was monsoon season, the part of the year when heat and steam were the same, unrelenting. The traffic of bicycles and mopeds crisscrossed the windows, and the woman seemed glad to be free of it. There weren't many American women in Vietnam, and she didn't seem like a nurse or aid worker. She was old, surprisingly so, hair a silver sweep beneath a straw hat. I don't need help, she said. I need conversation. She was a reporter on assignment for a magazine that wanted her to write about the war in Vietnam from a woman's point of view. She was supposed to spend one month getting a sense of the country, the people, the culture, and distilled all into an article. My grandfather, always interested in other people's stories, sat and talked with her while my mother watched from the kitchen. I have imagined the languorous way Rose might have sat, the way her dress folded around her, making her seem protected somehow, as if she knew the war would not touch her. Rose stopped by the cafe often during her week in Saigon, and though she and my grandfather talked for hours, he remembered little about her history. If Rose revealed her full name, if she spoke about her own mother and father, or anything about the roots of her family, he didn't remember. He recalled instead her lively voice, her many questions about Vietnam. He remembered her largeness, how she always wore a hat. In anticipation of her visits, he reserved pineapple and lychees for her. He gave her advice about lodgings in Da Lat and Hue. Sometimes he helped her cross the street. You are lovely, my mother remembered Rose saying, the loveliest little family. 10 years later, when my mother and grandfather fled Saigon for America, one of the few things they took with them was a small gold pin engraved with a picture of a house. Rose had dropped it, perhaps, forgotten it, left it sitting on the table where a plate would be. My mother found it, and handling it like a rare insect, showed it to my grandfather. They had kept the pin safe, but Rose never came back. Thank you. Um, next, we have Timothy Yu, who is the director of the Asian American Studies Program at UW Medicine. Um, he's the author most recently of 100 Chinese Silences, the editor's selection at Le Fig Press, um, and of Race and the Avant Garde Experimental and Asian American Poetry since 1965. Um, that book won the Book Award in Literary Studies from the Association of Asian American Studies. Um, He's currently working on a project around John Berryman, and you can check out two of those poems at the margins. Let's give him a hand. Uh, thanks very much, Ken, and thanks uh, for everyone for turning out. And I really appreciate Ken and the workshop setting this up on, uh, uh, on very short notice and uh, taking advantage of the fact that we've got so many Kundiman folks here to bring us in. You know, I, uh, I, I must admit I'm, I'm sort of having a geek out moment about the couch because um, I, I've seen all these, I've never, I've never been to the workshop before, this is my first time. And I've seen all the photos from the events and I'm like, it's the couch, it's the green couch. So I'm, I'm excited to be in front of the couch, okay. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do uh, tonight is talk a little bit about uh, my new book, 100 Chinese Silences. And um, the images that I have are really not pictures of anything, I realize, they are simply other texts. But I think that in a way that's very appropriate for this project because what this project did is not so much a project that's inspired by real objects in the world, if we can say that or make that distinction, but is uh, responding to and inspired by other texts. So it's a kind of conversation with a particular tr literary tradition. Uh, but it also has a really specific origin story. I think Jazz Winder talking about um, you know, uh, sci-fi made me think about the idea of an origin story, and so here's this book's origin story. Um, so a few years back, uh, the, uh, the poet Billy Collins, our former poet laureate, a uh, very well-known poet, you've probably heard him on uh, Garrison Keillor's program on NPR, um, came to Madison, uh, Wisconsin, where I live, to do a reading. There were about 1,200 people at this reading. Uh, which was really remarkable, and so I sat there and listened to Collins read. And uh, Collins read this poem called uh, Grave, and uh, there it is. Uh, this, uh, this poem by Collins uh, is about standing at the graves of his parents and talking to them. And, of course, they're not responding because they're dead. And he talks about the fact that 
his father's silence was like the 100 kinds of silence according to the Chinese belief. Now, when Colin said this, I thought, well, that's interesting. I'm not an expert on all things Chinese, but uh, this doesn't sound really familiar to me. So that at the end of the poem, Colin says, uh, and uh, the thing about the 100 Chinese silences, the business about the 100 Chinese silences, I just made that up. And I thought, oh my goodness. Um, and uh, the, the, the feeling of frustration that I had when I heard this immediately turned into this, I, I vowed to myself at that very moment that I was going to write these 100 Chinese silences. <laughs> now, I had no idea what that meant at the time, but what it turned into was uh, I decided to begin by simply rewriting this poem. Um, and uh, that turned into Chinese silence number one, the very first uh, silence in the book. So I'm going to start by reading that poem. Um, this is Chinese silence number one after Billy Collins' grave. What do you think of this poem? I asked the tomb of my unknown grandfather with its livid, quiet marble. A Chinese silence fell. <laughs> It's okay to laugh. Um, it dropped from a glowering tree to perch on my shoulder. We looked at each other. It would have been hard for a stranger to tell one of us from the other. We both looked like monks or scholars or like piles of drowned bones laid softly on the loamy earth. My grandfather said nothing. His Chinese silence coiled its tail into the shape of a long-lobed ear, one of the 100 American signs for anxious virility. <laughs> then the silence fell into a cardboard box full of other silences. Like blind puppies, they squirmed and snuffled for their mother. Okay, I made that last part up. But you must admit it was a fabulous metaphor. No? Oh. Now I see you are just as Chinese as all the other silences. The silence of the heavily armed gunboat, or the silence of the drunken mariner, or my grandfather's silence, like the Liberty Bell, only cracked right through. <laughs> so um, after I had done this, and uh, I kind of stepped back and looked at this poem and said, OK, what, what on earth am I doing here? Um, I uh, began to look around for uh, other poems by Collins that were somewhat in the same vein, that thematized or talked about China or Asia in some way. It turned out there were a lot of them. Uh, so I eventually wrote something like 25 rewritings of Billy Collins' poems, um, which end up making you know, about the first fifth or quarter of the, uh, the quarter of the poems in, in the book. Um, and uh, what interested me about Collins' seeming obsession with China was the way in which it seemed to draw on a much longer tradition of poets talking about China or Asia in some way. And I'll kind of play out how that, uh, how that appears in a moment. But um, I, I did want to read one more poem from the poems that I rewrote of Collins's because this one is a rewriting of a rewriting. So um, Collins has a poem that is called the day Lassie died. Now, um, you might guess that this is a rewriting of another poem. So if we can have the next image. It is a rewriting of Frank O'Hara's The Day Lady Died. But yes, it's about Lassie. OK, so uh, this is you know, uh, O'Hara's, uh, you know, one of O'Hara's most famous poems. Um, it's one of his I do this, I do that poems. He talks about, you know, getting off the train and going to dinner, and then he's going around uh, shopping for, uh, you know, gifts for his friends and so on. Um, Collins's poem, you know, the next, the next one, um, rewrites it as a story about the death of Lassie. And, uh, you know, even though this poem doesn't really, although it does, in fact, reference the Chinese, as you can see, um, he decides, uh, you know, it, um, I believe that uh, O'Hara goes into a store and buys some Verlaine for his, his friends. And um, instead, um, 
Collins uh, talks about uh, going into Olson's Emporium in Sawyer County, Wisconsin, and uh, buying a book about Zen. So um, I decided to, um, well, just as Collins had stolen this poem from Frank O'Hara, I decided that I would steal it back. So um, this is Chinese Silence number 23 after Billy Collins, the day Lassie died, which is, of course, after Frank O'Hara, the day Lady died. It is 12.20 a.m. Beijing, a Thursday, two months after the bicentennial of our nation. Yes, it is 1976, and I write some poems that sound like what a third-rate Wallace Stevens would think up after giving, getting off the 7.15 in Hartford and then not even bother writing down before going into dinner. I stop into Yu Hu's New York Chinese Cafe and have Egg Fu Young and Mushu Pork and open up my ugly fortune cookie to see what the poets in China are saying these days. <laughs> I go on to the laundry and Mr. Lee, first name or last name, who knows, hands over my shirts with a side of silence. And in the Chinatown Oriental bookstore, I get a little lipo with erotic drawings for myself, along with Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. And I don't see, and I don't see on contradiction or serve the people, I keep my eyes on lipo and fall into an exotic silence. And to assure my future as poet laureate, I stroll into a Buddhist temple and ask them if they will help me shovel snow. And they tell me to go back where I came from, so I walk out with a carton of incense, and some lady slaps me with a little red book with his name on it. And I am crying a lot now, and thinking of urinating in the alley behind the four spot, while he, uh, while he rose from his bed to shake the hand of Dick Nixon, and everyone and I fell silent. So, um, as, uh, as I said, what I began to realize gradually was that uh, this was not simply a, uh, an oddity of uh, Collins's poetry, but in fact part of a very long tradition of American poetic Orientalism. And so that Collins's interest in China was really simply a signal that he was writing modern American poetry. And uh, this is a tradition that stretches all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century and, of course, stretches back to Ezra Pound, who uh, Eliot remarked was the inventor of, uh, of China for, uh, for uh, modern poetry. And so uh, what, I, um, what, I decided, what I gradually had to look at other poems that kind of stretched back into this tradition. Uh, so um, I started having to take on kind of better known poems. So uh, the next poem that I'm going to read um, is a, uh, a rewriting of a well-known poem by Gary Snyder, uh, Snyder's poem, Axe Handles. So uh, this is one of Snyder's best known poems, actually. And uh, what, uh, what uh, Snyder's talking about in the poem is he's teaching his son, Kai, um, uh, how to throw a hatchet and then how to make an axe. And um, he says that uh, he remarks, uh, when making an axe handle, the model is not far off. Uh, the pattern is not far off. And uh, he presents this as a piece of um, the old phrase uh, from, uh, you know, from Chinese wisdom. Uh, and the phrase learned from Ezra Pound many years ago. So uh, what, what Snyder is doing in this poem is referencing this tradition of a kind of a Chinese influence in modern poetry that goes all the way back to Pound. Um, now, it's a, a and the, the famous lines there at the end, Pound was an axe, Chen was an axe, I am an axe, and my son a handle. Um, you know, so it's, it's a very powerful poem. Uh, it's a very serious poem. Uh, it, it's about sort of learning and pedagogy and generations. And so I decided to do a really juvenile take on the whole thing. <laughs> Uh, so this is Chinese silence number 38 after Gary Snyder's axe handles. One afternoon, the second week in December, my son is throwing a hissy fit, turning and turning like a routed stump. He's got it in his hatchet head that he wants to go shopping. He can't get a handle on himself on his own backside. I grab him by his ass handle and swing him back like a hatchet thinking to cut him down to size and get it through his head that he's this close to a trip to the woodshed. So I begin to tell him about the Chinese and their patient silence. The silence learned from Ezra Pound at Rapallo. C'est moi dans la poubelle. And I say this to the kid. Look, I'm going to slap your handle with my handle and the ass it rode in on. And he sees and I hear it again. 
It's in a draft of 16 cantos, 1924 AD, canto 14, in the first stanza. Faces smeared on their rumps, wide eye on flat buttock, bush hanging for beard, addressing crowds through their arseholes. I translated that into Chinese and taught it to Americans, and I see. Pound was an ass, I am an ass, and my son a handle. Soon to be wheeled ag- wielded again, silent tool watching me pull a culture from what I'm sitting on. Uh, so, of course, uh, ultimately, well, you know, I, I could have, I realized in writing these poems that I actually could have probably written two or three or four hundred Chinese silences because what eventually started happening was that people started sending me poems saying, like, hey, Tim, have you seen this one? You know, this would be really great for you. And so, you know, I, I, and after a while, I didn't even have to look for poems anymore. People were just, you know, sending me poems to, to give, the, you know, this, this treatment to. But um, I, uh, I eventually did have to go all the way back to the source. And so the final uh, series of poems in the anthology in, in the collection. Anthology? Why did I call it an anthology? Okay. Um, the collection uh, is a, uh, are all from Ezra Pound himself. And so um, the final poem uh, that I'm going to read is um, a rewriting of one of Pound's best known translations from the Chinese, uh, The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter. And so, um, of course, uh, Pound became very well known uh, in part from his translations from the Chinese uh, his, in his book Cathay. And uh, if those of you who know the story of Cathay, um, Pound uh, came into uh, possession of the notes of a scholar named Ernest Fenelosa. Fenelosa had uh, lived in Japan and had worked with Japanese scholars of Chinese literature. And so Fenelosa had had these notes that were kind of literal translations, character by character, of classical Chinese poems. But uh, Fenelosa died before he could ever finish the translations. Pound found these, and although he didn't speak a word of Chinese, uh, was absolutely convinced that he'd found a totally kind of new, uh, you know, new insight into what Chinese poetry was. And so he kind of used these literal translations to make his, you know, his own very brilliant translations. Um, but I really wanted to think through in my own take on it, sort of what, uh, what Pound was trying to do with China and how he kind of created an image of China um, that really led to uh, the, the tradition that I treat in the rest of the book. And so a lot of these poems, this wasn't really intentional, but a lot of these poems ended up being infused with biographical details about Pound's own life, because I wanted to think through how this fascination with China uh, kind of uh, become connected to a lot of the other things about Pound and his personality, uh, his political views, his fascism, um, and so on. So um, the final poem that I'm going to read then is uh, Chinese Silence number 99, which is after Ezra Pound, the river merchant's wife, a letter. When my verse was still laid out in straight pentameters, I played about with Provençal, growling ballads. You whispered in cribbed notes, saying, horse. You drew about my feet the ideogram for plum. And we started writing in the style of imagism, three small rules without ornament or description. In 15, I published my Li Po. I tried to speak, and out came silence. Lowering my head, I rammed the great wall. Corrected a thousand times, I never looked back. In 17, I said, hang it all. I desired my poems to be garbed in yours forever and forever and forever. Why should I be held to account? In 45, I departed. I went far into Washington by the river of cold forgetting. And you have not come to visit. The critics make self-righteous noise at the door. You bound my feet when you went out. By my book now, the glosses grow, the different glosses, too many to clear them away. The leaves fall, and I try to keep them from falling. The manuscript pages are turning yellow with peril under the covers of the West's sick bed. They desert me. I grow silent. 
If you are coming down through the narrows of the Potomac, please call me your Confucius. <laughs> and I will come out to meet you as far as Arlington. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, I think I've located the panda-flavored Pocky Stick. Um, and uh, if you too would like a panda Pocky Stick, um, I think uh, let's give a hand to all the readers. Uh, we have books for sale. Um, uh, books for sale. Uh, if you enjoyed this evening, please sign up for our mailing list and consider making a donation. Um, and also, please grab a glass of wine and come up to the readers and tell them how wonderful their work was. Ask them questions, uh, give them money, hugs, <laughs> violate their personal space in ways that are very deeply uncomfortable. Don't do any of that stuff except for the money. Tell them how great they are. Thank you for coming. <laughs> But after a day or so of thinking about it, I thought, you know, um, I need to know what, what's going on. And reading the standard operating procedure manual of Camp Echo at Guantanamo Bay would be a way for me to begin to understand that. One of the first things you learn when you play Scrabble are all the words that take a cue and not a U. And when I started writing, I felt like I was constantly being dealt the cue and not a U. Just because I had so many blind spots when, I came, when it came to writing and reading and just taking myself seriously as a writer.